Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Continuous Glucose Monitoring for Diabetes, Obesity and Metabolism Research in Rodents. This is Andy Henton from Inside Scientific and I will be your host for today's event. Our session is sponsored by Data Sciences International and will focus on how scientists can apply a new method of continuously monitoring blood glucose via implantable telemetry. By way of case study, our presenters will show how a complete glucose profile can be observed using the new PhysioTel HDXG implant, leading to a reduction in animal stress and associated labor for the lab team. I would also like to make special mention that only weeks ago, PhysioTel HDXG was named an R&D 100 award finalist in the analytical and test instruments category. So a big congratulations to the DSI team and their co-developers at Nova Biomedical. So today we will hear first from Dr. Ralph Duchenne, group leader of the Experimental and Clinical Research Center at the Max Delbruck Center for Molecular Medicine in Berlin, Germany. Dr. Duchenne will discuss how he has applied continuous glucose monitoring in a pregnant rat model of type 2 diabetes and discuss benefits that he has experienced since adopting this new technique. Following, we will be joined by Christian Snell, lab head in, in the in vivo pharmacology and oncology research group at Novartis in Basel, Switzerland. Christian will compare and contrast traditional acute glucose measurements with the new continuous approach, including review of the surgical procedure he uses, and share his opinion regarding the value of continuous glucose data in the application of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics while testing oncology compounds. In addition, before we begin our webinar, DSI would like to announce that they have partnered with NC3Rs, specifically their Crackett Solutions Program, to facilitate research documenting the scientific and animal welfare benefits associated with the HDXG implant. Ideally, the research will directly compare and contrast the use of the HDXG with current glucose measurement methods to delineate advantages and disadvantages of each. Uh, to learn more about this program and how to get involved, you can contact DSI directly or visit www.crackit.org.uk. Information about this program will also be listed on InsideScientific.com following the webinar. It's a privilege to be with you and um, I would like to share the data which we have obtained uh, with the continuous glucose measurement in uh, pregnant rats. Our research group is interested in um, understanding end organ damage, hypertensive and metabolic and we have a long interest in, in preeclampsia and uh, now in gestational diabetes and uh, we are very keen on using this new device. And uh, we started using it in a model which was developed in our institute by a collaboration partner Michael Wader and he has uh, used a small hairpin RNA mediated knockdown in the rat. Probably most of you know that it's um, much more difficult to have knockdowns or knockouts in the rat and the uh, small hairpin RNA technique um, where he um, knocked down the insulin receptor enabled him um, or us to use um, um, a, a, a very interesting new model and um, this um, construct is under the control of doxycycline inducible so depending on how much tetracycline we give in the drinking water we can induce the insulin, re insulin receptor by 20, 40, 60, 80 or 95 percent uh, with some variety in the tissue organs. And the interesting um, thing in this model is it has some uh, very specific characteristics. It can be um, induced and it is reversible and it's a better model for really type 2 diabetes because it's mediated via insulin resistance. And um, we would like to be interested in two models in pregnancy. One is a pre-existing diabetes and the second one is a gestational diabetes. And this is from the original uh, publication. Depending on how much tetracycline you give in the drinking water, uh, 20 milligrams, 2 or 0.5, you see the blood sugar is rising uh, within 2, 4 or 8 days. And um, in, in this um, experiment, uh, as soon as the blood sugar about 350 was achieved, the doxycycline was reduced to the maintenance dose of 0.5 milligrams. And then when the doxycycline is removed from the drinking water, blood sugar goes back to normal. And uh, these are data from, from our model in, in the, the pregnant rat mother. So we really, before we started using the uh, DSI technique, we had to really confirm that it's really type 2 diabetes. And you see in the diabetic rats, the blood sugar is high, the HOMA index is high, the plasma insulin and the C-peptide levels are high. So really uh, the complete picture of insulin resistance. Um, 
And uh, this model has recently been used in, an, in, in a different model where we have used angiotensin 1 to 7 first in a kind of prevention study. So it was added while the uh, uh, insulin resistance was induced, and you see the difference here. But you can also use the model uh, as a therapeutic studi uh, study where you induce the blood sugar, you see up to 300, 400, and then you give the drug, in this case it was NG1 to 7, as a therapeutic target. This slide is just to remind you um, as the audience that gestational diabetes is getting an increasing problem. Um, the, the left um, part of the slide shows that uh, especially gestational diabetes is getting more and more uh, prevalent and many researchers speak of a kind of an epidemic uh, of gestational diabetes. And the right slide is one of the um, newest um, um, summaries where all the studies have been summed up and it's very obvious that gestational diabetes is a, me a medical problem. It was increasing, um, um, it was an increasing uh, negative outcome for mother and for the fetus. And our initial, our final goal will be to investigate the fetuses of, um, mother, of mothers who had a diabetic or a non-diabetic pregnancy, and this goes all back to the Barker hypothesis, um, which basically claims that if you have an insult, in this case it would be diabetic pregnancy, during a sensitive period in your development, because you have to remember that more, nearly 50% of all cell divisions which you're going to do in all your life are done within the, um, um, within the, um, the um, fetal period, and that this insult will have long-term consequences for your future cardiovascular and metabolic profile. Um, and again, if you're not familiar with the, with the rat, this is uh, how a, rat, a pregnant rat looks like, and it consists of six to eight, to up to 15 individual uh, pregnancies, so every fetus has his own individual uteroplacental unit and can be viewed as one individual pregnancy. I would like to lead you through this pretty complicated mating um, scheme. So if you go uh, to the top where you see um, the female the T O rat, which can be where the um, um, insulin resistance can be used by tetracycline, it is mated with a wild type male and doxycycline is given before the mating. And we knew it from preliminary experiments that the uh, blood sugar will remain during all the pregnancy, so we do not have to give doxycycline during pregnancy. So what we are having is a diabetic mother shown in red. The control group would be a wild type rat, which has no small hairpin RNA construct in itself, but she is mated with a tetracycline um, um, resistant uh, male. So if we give doxycycline in her case, she does not respond, and this is our non-diabetic um, pregnancy control. The interesting approach is now because the offspring, you see them all both, in both cases, uh, black, which is uh, control, and red insulin resistant. So basically what we can do is we can compare later on the wild type fetuses who are the normal insulin resistance coming from a normal pregnancy, and we can compare them wild type fetuses who had been in a diabetic insulin resistant pregnancy. And we also can compare insulin resistant fetuses who had been in a normal glycemic pregnancy and compare them to insulin resistant fetuses who had a diabetic pregnancy. So in both cases, we can evaluate the effect. On, on the offspring of a diabetic pregnancy. And we were, when we had this idea and wanted to do these experiments, we were pretty sure we need accurate glucose measurements of the mother. And this is how the um, continuous um, glucose measurement from DSI looks like. Um, you see here the uh, glucose sen uh, sensor and the connector, and in blue is the reference electrode. The glucose sensor is free-floating in the aorta, and um, the, um, the, the signal is lasting at least um, 30 days, depending on high, how high the blood sugar is. So in our experiments, we try to aim for a blood sugar of about 300, maximum 400. We always had a signal for at least 30 days. 
the goal is that you we have to re that we by that can reduce the blood draws from our rats that they are less stressed and we have much better um, uh, data uh, available and we also can um, get the data for activity and temperature similar to the blood pressure telemetry where it can also measure activity which we have done in the past and still do as well. Um, this shows you <coughs> how the um, continuous glucose uh, measurement is implanted. Um, um, the scheme on the right side shows where it should be implanted in the aorta, should be above the iliac arteries and below the renal arteries and here you should see how the aorta is cannulated and the sensor will be put in next. Once the sensor has been in, put in, the uh, connector where you see this green, um, green stuff is uh, sutured and then this is shown then here in the scheme and here you show how the reference electrode, this blue stuff, is sutured to the muscle. And here on the right side you see an example of um, a normal glycemic uh, animal over 24 days. So the, the, the pregnancy in red takes about 21 days and here it's compared in red, you see in a um, diabetic red, you see the, the blood sugar, how it rises before we started the mating and the mating is probably start, uh, after mating you see the blood sugar, how it fluctuates into the day and night rhythm. In the next slide we have a higher amplification of the diabetic rat. You see here um, uh, on the um, y-axis uh, the glucose levels they should be between 300 and 400 and you see very nicely how they fluctuate to the day and night rhythm and we have a data point acquired every minute and you see this lasts here for two to three days. Um, it took us some while to get the ideal conditions for the glucose tolerance tests. Um, here you can show, we show the interperitoneal one, we also did oral glucose tolerance tests and when we started with a recommended dose of uh, 2.05 grams per kilogram, we didn't get this sufficient increase. You see the mean it goes, uh, blood sugar goes up to 175, so we then repeated it a day later, uh, two days later with a higher dosage and here we have a nice increase. Um, you see in the medium about 300 to 305, 350, which is much better to evaluate. Um, here shown just an overlay of all the diabetic animals. In the upper part you see um, the non-pregnant and in the lower part you see the, the, the pregnant or diabetic rats and you see the blood sugar between 250 and 500 and um, you see in, in one device we had a problem with the transmission for some days. We do not know why it resolves later on but for all the other transmitters we didn't have any technical problems and surgery was successful in all of them. However, one has to say we have long, long um, um, experience with the blood pressure telemetry for over 20 years. This is more or less the same slide for the control group. Upper part again, the non-pregnant animals which we did Every color stands for one animal and the lower part is a normal glycemic pregnant controls. And this is just if we look at the medians, um, the upper part the diabetic pregnancy versus non-pregnancy and the lower part the normal glycemic controls and the thing which became very obvious and was surprising for us that during um, beginning from the mid-term of pregnancy in the non-diabetic controls the pregnancy group, which is in purple, had lower blood sugar levels compared to the non-pregnant normal glycemic control, um, which the difference was, the longer the pregnancy uh, was going, the difference was getting bigger. This difference is not seen in the diabetic groups, however, in the medium phase of pregnancy, uh, we see that the pregnant rats having higher blood sugar levels compared to the non-pregnant, so quite opposite to the normal glycemic controls. This slide illustrates the non-normal glycemic, so the control groups, and in blue you see each individual um, uh, pregnant rat and in, in, um, in red the uh, non-pregnant controls. 
and you, you can appreciate the differences in blood sugar if you look at the median and the 25 to 75 percent and the extreme values how high the variability is and you see from how from day 14 the blue and the red group separate with lower levels for the uh, pregnant versus the non-pregnant controls. The same figure for the diabetic rats, pregnant shown in um, blue and non-pregnant shown in red and again you can appreciate the higher variability for each animal where the blood sugars variate from less than 200 to more than 750 and you also see that there's not much difference between pregnancy and non-pregnancy with a tendency around day 10 to day 15 with um, higher levels in the blue pregnant versus the red non-pregnant group. Since pregnancy is, uh, is changing and um, uh, over the course we now divided here the um, normal glycemic um, animals for early pregnancy which is day 7, this is when um, the placental development is more or less completed and then mid pregnancy which is day 15 and day 20 and again you can appreciate the differences um, for each rat. The same now for the diabetic rats, now um, distributed for early, middle and late pregnancy, pregnant versus non-pregnant. And here uh, are our first results. The, the, the statistical interpretation is still going on. Since there are so many data points, it is uh, really, a, um, you have to include, and in, or it's better to include animals with lower glucose levels for the uh, diabetic rats versus the non-diabetic. This difference is not present in the um, diabetic animals where if at all the values are higher in pregnancy versus control. And one thing which was obvious for both groups but, but very prominent for the diabetic group that the coefficient of variation which is um, a marker for, for how variable the, weight, the data is um, value of 0.1, especially for the diabetic group, is very high. So it means it is more or less impossible, or you need a big, big number of animals if you really want to have a representative value by just one single or by two single measurements, as we do it without the continuous glucose measurements. And we started to do simulation, and um, you can reduce the number of animals by 19 to 6 if you use the continuous glucose measurements um, for this type of uh, experiments. Um, so this is a very, very valuable um, method, the continuous glucose measurement. You get better values and you need much less animals. So to sum up my talk, I would like to, to, um, to, 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 to summarize that in the current practice is that individual um, Blood samples are taken from restrained animals. This is difficult. We all experience that this stress, for example, is always very difficult for the control group because you quite often have high blood glucose levels just because of the stress in the control group. Um, and the number of blood samples are limited, and this collection needs a lot of work. And in the end, you get an incomplete um, profile of your blood glucose measurement. With the continuous glucose measurements for a month, you have optimal conditions to have a complete profile, uh, which is accurate, and uh, the animals are free moving and unstressed. It is a very good method to perform, to perform glucose tolerance tests, and um, there's direct connection to the data management systems, as we all know it from the uh, blood pressure telemetry device. The operation is critical and Christian, my next speaker, will talk about it as well. Um, we saw some adhesion and fibrosis and encapsulation which we did not observe with the telemetry, but at the moment our experience is limited so we're not sure if this is representative. Um, 
for me, the major drawback of the system is that the absolute values depend on the calibration. So several calibration steps are needed and are essential. And for sure, all of us um, uh, has its price, but we are seeing it's uh, definitely worth it. Thanks again for the invitation to present our latest data on this very exciting new technology. So I'm going to talk uh, on what we have done in, in my lab uh, with this device in terms of uh, measuring hyperglycemia profile of our drugs and uh, what was a add-on basically uh, compared to the so-called traditional way. So I think the traditional way we've certainly most of you will agree, is that mostly we take um, a blood sample from the tail uh, in, in mice. That's quite straightforward, very easy to do. In rats, it's a little bit more complicated due to the fact that the vein is located a little bit deeper, so it's, it's feasible, but uh, it's a little bit more labor intensive. Moreover, uh, here in, in oncology, uh, we are working a lot with uh, new rats uh, and they have a little bit um, a colored tail and the data I'm going to show you today were collected in brown Norway rats and these guys they have basically a black uh, tail so it's very difficult to, 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 to get to the vein uh, each time especially if you have some time constraints so what we have uh, selected as an approach then uh, was to uh, use a very short isofluor anesthesia and then we take the blood from the, uh, from the tongue so it's a sublingual uh, uh, blood collection. The advantage is that we are not limited really by the volume. Uh, we can take more. So this allowed us, in addition, not only to measure glucose but also uh, the PK uh, inside this uh, sample. And um, we are using, uh, since now six months, I would say, uh, the new device uh, from DSI for uh, the remote monitoring of glucose in, in these rats. Um, as Ralph already showed you, uh, this is how it looks like. We have a reference electrode and then uh, I think the key part is the center at the, at the end. You can see on the right uh, side of the screen uh, the size, so it's very small, 0 0.7 millimeters, so it fits very nicely in the artery of a rat. And um, the very nice part is that uh, the chemical reaction which is happening on the tip of this catheter is basically exactly the same what you have in a glucometer. And uh, we all know that nowadays it's very important to have a perfect translation between the preclinical data and the clinical one. So we are using the same, um, the same method, uh, the glucose oxidase, and uh, this is something I think is going to be pivotal uh, in order to allow a better comparison. Uh, now going back to the surgery, as Ralph already mentioned, I think this is really pivotal. Uh, you will see that people we are, which are used to use the blood pressure devices, uh, they will think, no, it's heaven, because uh, the catheter is much easier to insert in the, in the artery. It's a little bit sticker, stiffer, so that makes things very, very easy. Uh, the approach, which was already designed uh, or uh, talked about by, by Ralph, is the abdominal artery. and um, uh, it's very important that you have prepared your surgery field uh, adequately so that you have these two uh, sutures in place so that at the moment when you are going to put a hole in the artery, you can block uh, the blood flow. And um, then using uh, an inserter, which is basically here, a 25 gold needle, you just put a little hole in the artery and then under the microscope or if you have uh, uh, good eyes, you can even do it without, uh, you can just uh, push then the catheter inside. It's very important uh, that the tip of the catheter is really nicely inserted in the artery, um, and uh, but not too much. So if it's very important not to go over the, the, the occlusion suture because this uh, would um, maybe damage the, the quality of your sensor. So that's very important to, to, to have a, a control over that. Uh, once you have done that, very important also to dry nicely uh, the entry site in the artery so that uh, afterwards you can uh, cover this entry site with a drop of tissue glue and then also with um, a, a patch uh, which basically is promoting the tissue, uh, fibrotic tissue formation around the catheter and then really sealing in place for really long, long time. So that's, I would say it's very straightforward. Uh, not different from the blood pressure uh, implantation, 
even a little bit uh, easier, I have to say. Uh, then the body of the transmitter is sutured uh, when you close the abdominal wall uh, with three different uh, uh, anchors which are already included in, in, in the body of the transmitter. And then on the left side you can see now the rod uh, two weeks later, so I think it's perfectly tolerated, very nice wound healing. Uh, there's no way to distinguish an implanted rod from a non-implanted one. Uh, so now this is how it looks like in my lab. So on the left side you have the cage with uh, his um, with the implanted rat. Important, you can see we have also a partner. So normally we wait around seven to eight days after surgery, and then uh, we re-socialize uh, our rat with with a permit, and we sample the, the glucose every minute as Ralph uh, is describing before. And then on the right side, we have the data on our computer. So coming back to what I just mentioned about uh, um, the partner to be added to the implanted, and I think we all know that rats and mice are highly social animals. Uh, for me, my feeling over the past 20 years is that there is no way to isolate a, a rat or a mice and arguing that this animal is going to be normal. So uh, what we did here is that we just follow the, blood the body weight change after implantation over time uh, in these so-called single house conditions, which is now what you see on the screen. And you see that basically after an initial decrease in body weight of around 3 to 3.5 percent, the animal recovers very nicely after eight days. So Everybody would say, that's perfect. That's exactly what we want to see. But when we add now another partner, you can see now that the shape of the curve, the angle of the curve is changing dramatically. So the animal is recovering very fast. And uh, you could also see it on the behavior. I think the feeding behavior is much more intense. Um, so I think something to keep in mind, uh, doing an experiment in single-housed animals is not always optimal. And I think if you are interested in physiological conditions, I would really argue and highly support uh, at least the um, pair host uh, situation. So what can we do now with this device? Because it's inside, because we can measure every minute, day and night, when we are sleeping, the system works for us. We can now really address uh, the so-called uh, chronobiology or the circadian rhythm. And we could very nicely see, as you see on this graph, the day and night rhythm, which was already shown also by, by Ralph. Um, and we can, at the same time, record body temperature and uh, motor activity. You see the gray bars are the activity in unit per time. And you see that during the inactive phase, which is our, the light time, our day, uh, glucose is around 5, uh, which for um, uh, American uh, uh, units is 90. And uh, you see that during the active phase, when they are awake, uh, glucose is increasing. And you can even see that each little uh, blip in, in activity uh, is also transferring in, in glucose, which is maybe due to the fact that they, are, they have an eating behavior at this time. Uh, this is now a body temperature a very nice mirror, basically, of the diurnal rhythm in, in glucose. You can see it also in temperature. We all know that we would see exactly the same in heart rate, in blood pressure. All the physiological parameters are really uh, uh, influenced by, by the diurnal uh, clock in, in, in our body. Um, Nevertheless, what, when we went back to, to this initial uh, glucose values during the inactive phase, we had values around, as I say, 5 to 5.5. Um, and our historical data, which we have collected in our lab, and even if you go to the literature, you can see that very clearly, is that values are more around 8 to 10 to 12 millimoles per liter. Um, so it's a what is going on? Is, is, is the calibration right or are we doing something wrong here? So we said maybe we have a, a stress effect due to the fact that we are using anesthesia only for a short time, but use, having a, a rat implanted with telemetry, we could now address this question. So what we did is that we measured uh, the glucose and temperature in the rat in his normal cage with his partner. Then we put the animal in, in, in the sleeping box uh, supplied with isofluorin for five minutes. And then we put the animal back in his cage and we just recorded uh, glucose and temperature. And then we discovered these kind of curves, which was really striking to us. So basically, after five minutes of isoflurane anesthesia, you see that glucose went from 3.5 to 8.5. Uh, body temperature, we have 1.5 degree decrease, even if we heat the animal during these five minutes. 
so you can really see that uh, anesthesia is a major um, uh, impairment of all the, our physiological uh, uh, levels in, in our body. I would say everything you can think about will be uh, affected by anesthesia, but here I think glucose it's really clear and for me now I think one possible explanation for this difference between this low level in telemetry and the high levels which we have measured uh, sublingually are certainly related to the stress effect of, of anesthesia even only for five minutes. What was quite interesting is that we could also measure uh, activity at the same time and you see on the right side now a magnification of these first five minutes after the animals were returned to their cage and you see that even during the time when they don't move, meaning they are still uh, sleeping, you see this tremendous increase in glucose. So it's not an effect of uh, increased activity but you see that once the animal recovers and starts to wake up, uh, you have a second peak in, in glucose which is then related to this uh, arousal uh, of stress due to the wake-up um, uh, phase. I think this slide, now number 19, is very uh, telling us. Uh, it's also, again, recapitulating what, what Ralph was already saying, is that not only we have a much lower value in the telemetry uh, recorded rats, but look on, uh, on variability. I think in the isofluorine one, we have values which go, as I say, from 7, 8 to even 16, uh, with a huge variability uh, in the telemetry, very, very low variability. And this is clearly the advantage in terms of three Rs. We can really get the same statistical power with our experiment by reducing the number of animals. Um, and this is something which I think at the end of the day is really going to, to change all, all the rules. So what is happening when we dose our animals? Because this is always a caveat, yes, we have a remote monitoring system, but we have to take the animals to give the compound. And this is what you see here when we dose our animals for uh, orally with, with a vehicle. There is basically not a lot happening on, on glucose. It's from 5 to 0.15. So I think this is something which uh, is not so stressful for the animal, especially not if you compare to, to the anesthesia. What Ralph already showed, uh, we could, could recapitulate it as well. So we have a very nice dynal rhythm, very consistent from one day to another in glucose, activity and temperature. And that's again a very nice um, uh, thing to have because you can use each animal as its own control just by subtracting the post-dose uh, data from the pre-dose data time matched and then you have a really delta effect and you can do this even uh, with a vehicle treated animal so you have really the best possible package for uh, a really thorough uh, statistical analysis. Now obviously the whole goal of this uh, was to to test our compound and to see what is going on in terms of hyperglycemia. So we know that this compound, which is presently in, 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 in the clinic, uh, has an on-target effect on, on uh, glucose reabsorption in, in fat tissue and in muscle, but we had no idea more or less how it, does it look in terms of uh, PK and PD. So we did uh, the blood uh, measurement, the blood glucose measurement after, let's say, one hour, four hours, six hours, eight hours. It was really arbitrarily. We hoped to be uh, in, in, in a nice range, but now with telemetry, we are not missing one single point because we take every minute a measurement, and you see that after the first day of treatment, uh, there is basically nothing happening on glucose, so the body is able to compensate with insulin, but then everything is breaking down, and you see that we have a clear reproducible hyperglycemia uh, profile with our compound, which I think now is really going to be the trans translatable to the human uh, situation, which was not the case in a, uh, a stressed animal due to the, to the anesthesia. So I'm quite confident that now we will have a very nice match with what we see uh, in our patients. Uh, as you know, nowadays without PKPD relationship, it's very difficult to do um, predictions in humans, especially for the first uh, for the first dose. So here uh, I have just uh, put the uh, PD profile in terms of hyperglycemia profile of the compound over 24 hours, and what I'm just doing now is just superimposing uh, the PK profile of of the compound, and you see that after the first two to four hours, when body takes time to increase the glucose, uh, we see a very perfect match between the glucose levels and, and the PK, and we see that when PK is going down, disappearing for the circulation is also, uh, the hyperglycemia is, is, is normalizing. And I think that's really something which is going to help us now to accurately and I'm sure perfectly predict what we are going to see in, 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 in our patients. So what about the success rate? I think as Ralph mentioned, uh, there is a certain 
price for all this and obviously we want to use it as long as possible. So uh, the guarantee is 28 days. Uh, these are now a summary of the first 13 rats I have implanted. So you see that 12 out of 13, which is 92%, uh, fulfill uh, the requirement from uh, from data science, so we are over 28 days, but not only that, you see that a lot of them are much, much longer. I think the, the winner is basically one uh, transmitter which I could use for 80 days, uh, and the other ones are a little bit um, uh, stretched, but I think what is quite important now is to understand what, as, what are the reasons why we had to stop uh, to record with the transmitters. And at the end of the day, if you see now on the slide, there are only four cases where it was a so-called hardware-related failure. Um, so two times the battery. I think the battery after 80 days, that's not a, not a surprise. Signal quality after 60 days, I think I can live with that. One battery after 40 days, that's the variability and one, uh, only one transmitter due to a signal quality uh, on, 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 on the sensor. But all the other ones were just stopped due to uh, side effects of, of the compound. So I think at the end of the day, we have really an 85% success rate uh, over 60 days, which I think is, is quite remarkable. So uh, just to wrap up, uh, I could show you that uh, it's really a nice device to have a continuous real-time measurement in, in unstressed animals. Uh, we can collect up to 84 days uh, with these 13 animals. I hope that we can even go a little bit longer. We have a tremendous uh, impact on the three Earths in terms of reducing variability. Uh, we could, at least for my case, with my compound, for the first time have a 24 hours continuous profile of hyperglycemia, which was never possible before. Uh, so I was quite... Uh, quite happy and impressed about that, I have to say. We have a very nice way to do real PKPD relationship uh, to predict the dose in humans. And uh, we hope that having now this uh, new technology in place and in our hands, we are going also maybe to change the way uh, our clinical trials are going to be done using the PS3 kinase inhibition, but that's just one example. I'm sure this will apply for a lot of other uh, uh, drugs. Uh, on the market or maybe which will come on the market quite soon. So that's all what I wanted to show you today in terms of oncology applications and happy to take questions. Okay, uh, Ralph, first question for you. It seems that most of your analysis was for a 24 hour period and then comparing those over time. Uh, did you evaluate light dark differences in more depth or do you think you will do so in the future? That's a very valid point. Uh, we definitely will do um, the uh, day comparison and night comparison, and especially um, since pregnancy is a difference between uh, the two groups, uh, we will see if the differences match with activity or if, for example, blood sugar levels are different at day or at night due to altered activity. And um, this is what we do at the moment. Okay. Very good. Um, next question, Christian. Uh, why do you take anesthetized, anesthetized blood glucose measures versus physically restrained blood glucose measures, um, blood from the tail, for, uh, for example? Um, and I guess, and if you did um, this, how do you think those results would compare to glucose via telemetry? Yeah. That's a, that's a very good question. I, I have already addressed a part of it during my talk, so I think the, the reason why we use the isofluorin sublingual approach was that uh, we wanted, first of all, to have blood at a given time and uh, for with 100% uh, success rate, and secondly, uh, we wanted a certain volume of blood in order to be able to do all the PK analysis afterwards. Um, since I am using now the DSI device and talking to the DSI folks, I, we discovered that basically it's quite easy just by um, uh, uh, having a needle uh, at the tip of the tail of the rat, even in the brown Norway with a black tail, uh, you could get uh, two to three drops of, of blood very uh, accurately. Um, so we did that and uh, this is the way also we are doing the calibration of, of our uh, transmitters. And uh, by using this approach, I think we could really see that the values we are, which we are measuring in these restrained uh, rats but without anesthesia are around uh, four or six uh, minimal per liter, which is exactly what we, what we are seeing with, with the transmitter. So I think clearly the stress effect even by restraining will come but much, much later with 10 to 15 minutes uh, delay. So the value you are going to, to measure on your tail, uh, even with a glucometer, is going to be really physiological. So that's something which we learned. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, that's, a, that's a great answer. Um, 
Very good. Uh, G1 has asked, what's, what is the maximum glucose level that this implant uh, device can detect? Usually a glucometer can detect up to 600. Uh, um, Scott, I'm going to uh, pass this one to you. Can you just comment on the, um, uh, the range in which the uh, device will operate? Certainly. Um, we have a YSI STAT 2300 in-house, which goes up to 900 milligrams per deciliter, and we have shown that it can measure that high with accuracy and linearity. Um, beyond 900, I personally have tested it up to about 1100, but then you have to rely on calculations for the solution I made, et cetera. Um, so I would say 900 reliably, uh, probably higher, but we don't have a reference to compare against. Okay. Maybe I, maybe I can just add in. I, I have a rat which uh, went to s levels around 750, and uh, it was no problem to to measure that with the device. Perfect. Um, kind of, I guess, uh, on the topic of um, performance of the device and 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 also calibration, because a number of questions have come in about calibration. Can uh, Christian, maybe you could start. What is your specific calibration approach? Like how many time, how how many calibration steps are required when these implants are in the animal? Like what's the frequency and uh, what can you share with the audience about uh, what you do in the lab? So uh, I would propose to to do first uh, the first calibration. As you know, is is a glucose tolerance test, um, and I think what Ralph mentioned is is valid. Uh, it's good to increase a little bit uh, the. Uh, the concentration of glucose in order to get this dynamic range. Um, once this is done, what we do routinely in my lab is that we do two calibrations, a single point per week, uh, mostly Tuesday and then on Friday. Uh, and uh, by doing so, we can really readjust uh, the possible drift which uh, will occur over time in, in your sensor. And uh, we can have really nice uh, stable data uh, by doing this. so. And as I say, it's very simple, just go on the tip of the tail, uh, you take your measurement uh, with your glucometer, and, and it, so it's very simple and, and, and it's very fast. Perfect. Uh, Ralph, do you have any additional comments? Not much to add. We basically have the same approach where we we had a discussion with DSI and this is exactly what they um, uh, asked us to do and um, then we have uh, this glucose tolerance test and then two single um, um, calibrations and we do, we do it two times um, 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 on Monday and Friday we do it, um, so, so it's probably the same, uh, similar to, to what Christian told. Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, all right, um, just sorting through the long list of questions that have come in here. Christian, you mentioned uh, the use of isoflurane through some of your research, and uh, some of our audience has asked about the effects of isoflurane on blood glucose measurements and levels. Can you comment on that? Um, uh, again, is this a concern uh, when you're using the implant or when you're not? And how might, might one plan for effects if there are any uh, when using that uh, anesthetic? Yeah. I think the answer is quite straightforward and simple. If you use isoflurane to do your uh, measurement of glucose, you are going to measure stress levels. It's as simple as that. It's not physiological at all because, as I say, everything uh, which is pivotal for the physiology of, of any uh, living organism will be affected by isoflurane. I can tell you, even if you take other anesthetics like uh, injection uh, anesthesia, you will see exactly the same. I think we have seen that with blood pressure, with heart rate. Everything is more or less mixed up by, by isoflurane. So uh, if you are interested in getting real uh, physiological data out of your animals, please don't use isoflurane. Um, uh, if it's just to collect samples, okay, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. be aware about uh, uh, the bias you are introducing by using isoflurane. Okay, very good. Any additional comments, Ralph or Scott? Or is that, uh, does that cover it? Yeah, I, I think Kristen explained it very nicely. I mean, it's similar to what we have observed with blood pressure. The, the problems with uh, isoflurane if you take uh, blood pressure with tail cuff, um, mm -hmm. and I think it's, it's perhaps even more pronounced with the blood glucose when I look at the, um, the values that Christian presented. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, okay, so let's uh, talk a bit more about the implant itself. So I think, Scott, some of this might go to you. Um, uh, first of all, can the implant be turned on and off while it's in the animal? 
The answer is yes. However, we do not recommend it. And the reason we don't recommend it is the way the glucose oxidase enzyme works. It is always functioning whether the device is on or off. And when the device is on, we're actually, through the process of how it works, we're taking up some electrons that occur and, and some hydrogen peroxide that's created. And if it's turned off, that builds up on the device, and it can actually damage it and make it so your device will not last as long. So it can, but I definitely do not recommend it. That's a great answer. Um, very good. Uh, also, again, on the implant, it's, uh, some of our uh, audience has asked about combined measurements with glucose. So we had a polling question of that nature. Uh, at this point, how would one go about, for instance, measuring activity alongside with glucose, or can that even be done um, at this stage? The device is capable of measuring glucose temperature and activity. So all of those features are built in. Um, I'll be interested to see the poll. From a cardiovascular perspective, uh, that is not possible with our current device. But we have recently released a RAT device for cardiovascular, which is on a second frequency. And that is being explored, uh, the idea of putting two implants in an animal to collect them both simultaneously. OK. Very, very good. Um... Okay, uh, Srini Jaraman uh, has, has asked a, what I believe to be a very good question. I hope it is. <laughs> uh, how important for researchers in the field of diabetes glucose research is it to combine this telemetric type of technology with automated blood sampling instruments? So um, the combined technology will enable researchers not only to measure online blood glucose levels, but also biomarkers of drug levels simultaneously. Um, Christian, uh, yeah. perhaps can that's you share your your uh, yeah. your opinion on this? I can tell you very easily that's a must, and uh, we ha we are in the process of ordering an automated blood sampler, and this is what we are going to do now. We are going to use a telemetry implanted rat with an automated blood sampler uh, in order to access uh, other bio potentials in the blood and the PK because for the moment we are restricted, as you would understand, to the so-called day phase of the animals when we are working. But uh, there is a big part which can happen during the active phase of our rats, which is our night. And I think that's something which is really going to open a lot in terms of uh, chronobiology and maybe chronotherapy in the future. So I think that's, yes, that's a must. Okay. Very good. Um, any additions, Ralph, uh, just on that subject? I think it's a wonderful idea, but we have not much experience with it, so we have uh, only used automatic uh, um, um, system once or twice. But perhaps Scott um, is aware of, of people who have done this in combination. Scott, any addition from you, or has Christian covered it in, in its entirety? Specific to the question, no. It, it was very well handled. OK, wonderful. All right. Um, Let's go back just to both Christian and Ralph. Can you just share your experience with the surgery of dealing with this implant? How long should uh, users expect that this surgery in a rat would take? Uh, are there any caveats or things that you would make them aware of to improve success rate? Christian, perhaps you could start. OK. But I, as I say, I think uh, for a trained person, for in which uh, use blood pressure uh, devices, it's very, it, it's it's a no-brain. It's very easy. Um, if you start with this kind of surgery, I would highly recommend uh, to practice with some dummies first, in order to get the sense. Especially, I think the pivotal part is when you do the hole in in your artery um, and then insert the catheter. That's something which needs to be perfectly harmonized uh, with your two hands. And I think here clearly uh, a microscope is helping a lot. Uh, and also I think quite important uh, what I uh, mentioned, really dry up all the blood which you will have somewhere around your catheter in order to allow the perfect um, uh, sealing using uh, the wet bond uh, glue. So I think these are the two pivotal parts. The rest is more or less, let's say, standard for, for, for surgery procedures. Mm -hmm. But I think these are really the important ones. OK. Excellent. Ralph, uh, some additions, uh, surgical tips and tricks, what you experience in your lab as far as time and uh, 
just in, in maximizing um, uh, the success rate and survival rate of the animals? Not really. I mean, we come from the same uh, angle as, as Christian tells. Um, we have in long time used the blood pressure telemetry, and we have uh, three technicians in the institute who do this as a core facility um, in the McLaren Center. And uh, for all of them, it was um, not much of a change. Now we switch to the continuous glucose measurement, but we are now having the first guests who, who, who learn this technique here from us. Um, I think this is uh, the dummy approach, which is important, but also to, to perhaps um, go and visit a site uh, which has experience in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Very good, very good. Uh, question uh, for you, Scott. Uh, could this sensor be placed in venous instead of arterial blood? Uh, the answer is yes. However, we don't recommend it. The primary reason is that our experience with pressure catheters suggests that there's a higher incidence of thrombus formation or occlusion. Mm -hmm. um, so it will work. It just might not work as long. And that's not proven. That's just based on our, our past experience. Okay. Very, very good. Um, and then actually continue on this. We've had another pe number of people kind of uh, just they're curious about the application of this uh, this one implant as far as what size rats should it work in, will it work in uh, any restrictions there body weight uh, could it also be used in slightly larger rodents or um, Scott maybe you could start with this is there um, a kind of like a stock answer from DSI as to how this implant can be used in which animals sure the the stock answer is uh, I believe 175 grams and larger. Mm -hmm. um, I will confirm that and we'll correct it in what we send out if that's incorrect. However, the design of this product actually uses a mouse-sized implant. So in mice, it's commonly used uh, 25, 30 gram mice and above. So honestly, if you have a, a rat that's 100 grams or above, I would envision it not being a problem. Mm -hmm. But the Formal answer is 175 and above. Okay. Um, I guess just from experience, Christian and Ralph, can you both comment? Uh, and Ralph, I think it would be interesting for you to comment about putting the implants in um, the, the the pregnant rats and just any intricacies or the things that you can rehash there. So Ralph, perhaps you uh, can start. Well, we did it before we did the mating, so we 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 had them in. In the, the non-pregnant phase, mm -hmm. but it should not be a problem. Um, one comment to to the uh, minimal weight, because what we are now doing, uh, we are planning to to, to do use uh, devices in the offspring, and um, there we had uh, also a couple of discussions, and we we said uh, the, the the offspring have to be about above 150 grams before we start implanting them. Mm -hmm. So something is 175. Mm -hmm. Very good. And Christian, anything to add? I think we are following the same rules. I think most of the time uh, we are using rats uh, over 170 grams. Perfect. Very good. All right. Well, uh, in the interest of time, we've come to the hour. Uh, so um, I'll, we'll end our Q&A session now. Uh, but obviously, a lot has come in and, and everything that has been uh, submitted during registration and today uh, will be addressed uh, by our presentation team in Data Sciences uh, International Meeting.